So we'll go from 10 to uh, 4. 10.1 to 10.4. Cheers. Uh, Vasudevendra Yogindram. Vasudevendra, Vasudevendra Yogindram. Natva Jnana Pradam Gurum. Natva Jnana Pradam Gurum. Gurum. Mumukshunam Hitardhaya. Mumukshunam Hitardhaya. Tatva Bodho Bhidhiyate. Tatva Bodho Bhidhiyate. Jeeva Ishwara Bheda Buddhi, uh, verse 10.1, who is the individual soul? Stula Shari Rabhimani. Stula Shari Rabhimani. Jeeva Namakam. Jeeva Namakam. Brahma Pratibhimbam Bhavati. Brahma Pratibhimbam Bhavati. Saeva Jeeva. Saeva Jeeva. Saeva Jeeva. Prakritya, Prakritya, Swasmat, Swasmat, Ishwaram Bhinnatvena Janati, Ishwaram Bhinnatvena Janati. 10.2 Conditionings of Jiva and Brahman Avidhyo Padihi, Avidhyo Padihi, Sanatma Jiva Ityuchate. Mayo Padihi Mayo Padihi Tanishwara Ityuchate Basics of the false view of world Evam Upadi Bedat Evam Upadi Bedat Jeeveshwara Beda Dristihi Jeeveshwara Beda Dristihi Yavat Prayantnam Tristati. Yavat Prayantnam Tristati. Tavat Prayantam. Tavat Prayantam. Janma Maranadi Rupa Samsaro. Janma Maranadi Rupa Samsaro. Na Nivartate. Na Nivartate. Na Nivartate. Correcting the false view. Tasmat Karanat Tasmat Karanat Jeeveshparayo Beda Buddhihi Jeeveshparayo Beda Buddhihi Nasvikarya Nasvikarya Okay, Hari Om everybody. Um, we are in the most, one of the most important concepts in Veda, <coughs> Vedanta actually. That is the first the text is going to give us the difference between Jiva and Ishwara. And then it's going to talk about Jiva and Ishwara Aikyam. That is that the commonality between the Jiva and Ishwara, which is the fundamental concept of Vedas or Shastras um, overall. The real objective of Vedanta is to teach you who you really are. We are all born with the fact that I am the body, mind, intellect. That is how we deal with with everybody else in the transactional world. And that's what we have been taught that you are X, Y, and Z. You are a male, you're, you're from this state or this country. This is how you look, this is how tall you are. This is how you weigh. And what the Shastras are saying is that you are not the body, but you are that Nityam, which is the Atma, which is actually powering the body. That is the fundamental goal or the true goal of every Vedantic script, that is to, real, to really teach you the real nature of you. And that, that's how we went through the whole process. We, we started talking about the Sadhana Chatushtaya, we looked at the Jiva, where we did the Jiva Vichara to find out what we are and what we are not. And then we concluded that we are the Atma, which is Satchidananda. Then we looked at the creation in the same format that we understood the jiva, we understood the creation or the Ishwara to be the creator and the Srishti to be the creation. The Ishwara was made up of Maya, Maya and Brahman and the jiva was made up of Avidya or the three Shariras and Atma. So right now, I think in chapter number 10, what the, 
The same two concepts are going to be used in 10 and 11. They are they're practically the same. We actually discussed this in a lot of detail as to how if you look at Ishvara in a superficial basis, then you are the creator, he is the creator. You are a servant, he is the karma faladata. But if you analyze the components of Jiva and the components of Ishvara, you realize that the underlying energy or the underlying entity that is powering the Jiva and that is powering the Ishvara is the same. So we realize that Atma plus Avidya is equal to Jiva. Brahman plus Maya is equal to um, Ishvara. And we realize that Avidya and Maya are not Nityam. They don't have an independent existence. They are like a shadow and the body. They depend on the Brahman for their existence. So therefore, you can conclude that if you go one level deeper, Atma and Brahman are the same. Now then it is not, there are certain schools of philosophy which thinks that Atma is a part of Brahman. No. Avidya says Atma and Brahman are the same. Like To give you an example, New Jersey is a part of United States. But United States is not part of New Jersey. That is, so we are not a part of the whole. We are the same. There is no difference between Brahman and Atma. They're exactly the same. That's a very important concept because that's how Advaita looks at this thing. There are other schools of philosophy which have different viewpoints. The Advaita obviously thinks that the Jiva and the, uh, and the Brahman are the different. The Vishwa Advaita thinks that Jiva is a part of Brahman, that is, as you gain moksha, you will become an appendage and that you will and you will go become part of the Brahman. That is fundamentally different than what Advaita says. Advaita says there is absolutely no difference between Brahman and Atma. This particular verses in any Upan Vedanta, Upanishad or any text, which actually provides the connection between the Jiva or between the Atma and the Brahman, is called Aikyam, is also called Mahavakya. Mahavakya meaning it is kind of enunciating or it is kind of revealing the truth behind the universe. So not in chapter 10, because in chapter 10, we are actually looking at the Bhedam, that is the difference between the Jiva and Ishwara. In chapter 11, you can construe those verses as a Mahavakya, because that is actually providing you a vision of the unity between the Atma and the Brahman. So we actually went through chapter 10. We were in, we had discussed each of the four uh, verses. And, uh, and I think we, I'm just going to give you a quick synop summary of it. And then I'll open it up for questions or doubts if people have. So as long as we think that we are the Jiva, that is, we identify ourselves with either the three Shariras or the three Avastas or the Pancha Koshas, then we consider our, ourselves to be different than the Ishwara. The, there is an Ishwara who is all, all powerful. And the Jiva, as we talked about, was essentially Atma, the Chidabhasa, and the Sukshma Sharira. That is, that entity was called um, Atma. So fundamentally for us to think that we are Brahman, the most important thing that we have to get rid of is that we are not the body, mind, intellect concept, but we are the Atma that remains the same in each of the three avastas that is reached after you remove each of the five koshas or after each of the three shariras are removed and what remains or what supports that is the, is the Atman, is it the true nature of what we are, and we are conditioned by, and we, I gave you this example of Upadhi and Upahita. Upadhi is something that is giving the false quality to the Upahita. So there is a mutual superimposition here. The body's conditioning is superimposed on an Atma which is ever present all over the universe. There's absolutely no point where the universe is, where Atma is not present. From a purely conceptual point of view, you can kind of think of it that it is something even subtler than space. So it is 
because remember we looked at the pancha kosha vivekas and we said as we get deeper and deeper into the koshas the kosha below is a controller but it also is all pervasive it is like for example we realize that prana kosha manomaya kosha vigyanamaya kosha vigyanamaya kosha is more subtle and it's more pervasive so we can think of atma is subtler than space just from a concept point of view and you take the pancha kosha viveka explanation atma is even subtler and more pervasive than even the space we can't even imagine it because that's not something that we can see but that is a way of kind of conceptualizing what the vedas are trying to tell you and then there was 10.2 it talks about why we think of ourselves that way it's also something that we have talked about the 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 false conditioning is also because of maya right maya actually has two components one is avarna shakti and vikshepa shakti avarna shakti is covering what is real and vikshepa shakti is projecting something unreal to be real so what maya does is that it covers the atma which is the real us but it projects the body mind intellect to be uh, to be the real to be i which it is not really true and then we said that the underlying entity that powers the jiva and the ishvara is the same but it is because of the different conditioning they look different to us and that's that that generates the false view of the world from that perspective and the correcting the false view is that we we first need to realize who we really are and that's how if you look at the way the text went through the fundamental problem that we have in this world is not knowing who the real i is right as long as we think that we are the body mind intellect we have the bondage with the world we have all the problems in the world for us to cross the samsara cross the ocean of bondage we have to break the body mind intellect concept and we have to start gaining conviction that body mind intellect is inert it's jadam it has a birth and a death like when we die technically it is not you dying it is the body mind intellect that dies but we are not that we are something beyond that and that is the most difficult thing to learn in vedanta and then there will be some sadhanas that we will get through in later chapters as to how you cultivate or how you gain see right now if you really spend analyzing it you doing the shravanam mananam you will actually what what is essentially is reading and then reflecting essentially looking at these concepts that have been presented and internalizing it um trying to get your doubts answered in a satsang like this or in any guru that you have then you gain the conviction that okay what the vedas are saying are true and then what we say is that we need to meditate on it we need to do nididhyasana meditation does not mean you need to always sit in the um, a meditation seat and then just kind of sit there that's not what there are different types of meditation you can actually be engaged in the transactional world without really getting involved constantly realizing that i am the entity i am the witness to what is going on i am not the person that is creating it and that's actually a much more difficult form of meditation but that nididhyasana is how you gain conviction in this knowledge you in our um, vedantic um, terms we we say that you tend to experience that knowledge or you it is deva anugraham that it's an intuition that comes through so you read through it and it is something that comes from within and that's why even the greatest of the intellectual saints like uh, adi shankaracharya or appaya dikshadar in tamil nadu there's so many of them they always wanted us to cultivate bhakti um this is not just like purely an intellectual exercise you need to love the god that is within you you need to have the bhakti and you need to constantly pray to the god to give you that salvation because you can do everything that you possibly can but to get the final to cross the final milestone you still need god's grace in the process like for example you can do everything that books tell you as to how to sleep but the actual sleep is not in your hands you can read a book you can drink milk and you can do everything that they say but 
falling asleep, you don't know when you fall asleep and the actual process of falling asleep is not in your hands. It is something that um, based on your karma, God gives it to you at some point. So let me stop there. And we looked at this thing in two ways, which we'll get into in a lot more detail. One is this whole question of Pratibhimba or Chidabhasa. That is one way of explaining Jiva. And the other way of explaining Jiva is the Upadi, which I talked to you about. I think those are the two different ways this book will explain it. So let me stop there and see if people have any questions or anything that doesn't make sense or is it, um, it, does it like just any thoughts or any doubts you might have. So Hariji yeah. does, is there only one Atma then? Like yeah. we said, Atma is everywhere, right? So we right. are, so there is only one Atma. There is one, the Atma that you have and I have and Rupa ji has or Usha ji has is the same, but they all have Atma. That is one Atma that is across the entire living beings, not just humans. It's also in plants. It's also yeah. in animals. It is one Atma that is the diversity that we see in this world comes from the body, mind, intellect concept. The three Shariras are different in each of the entities. That's what provides the entity. That's what provides the diversity. But underneath that, we are all Atma, which is the unity that we, that everybody is, has the same Atma. So in a way, the Atma that is in this body right now, I'm the same Atma, is giving me the experiences and I'm, you know, is it Atma, then it's, so where is the attachment coming from? Right? So if it's the same Atma and it, the Atma is just, and we are all getting different experiences based on which, where the body moves around and what body interacts with other bodies and experiences. So, Okay. What is attachment? Like, why is there an attachment? So is it like Atma in every body is behaving very differently, right? So no, the that? fundamental reason is what we said in verse number 10.1 is that you don't think you are the Atma. You think you are the Jiva. And as long as you think you are the Jiva, which is a reflection of the Atma through the mind, just like the mirror reflects you and you see the reflection in the mind, as long as you assume that you are a combination, you are a jiva, which is a combination of sukshma sharira and stula sharira, along with the chidabhasa, you will have the difference because the jiva will, the stula sharira and the sukshma sharira are going to be different for each one of us, right? Because that is your, that is the sharira that we have, that is the body, mind, intellect that we carry. And the reason we feel that we are different is that we don't recognize that we are the universal atma, but we are the jiva which is what this thing starts off with. The, that is the, the identification with the jiva is the root cause of all the diversity, root cause of all the problems that we have. The minute we kind of break that monotony, it's easily said than done. But the minute we break our identification with the body, mind, intellect and say that that is not me, that is like a t-shirt that I wear today. And I, in the next, G, next janma, I'll be dropping this body, mind, intellect and taking on another body, mind, intellect, depending on my vasana that I have, then you slowly progress towards attaining the spiritual growth or attaining the true nature of who you are. That is the knowledge of the self. That's what Ramana Maharshi said, knowledge of self is the knowledge of God. God is within you when we say it's the Atma is the God. But unfortunately, we don't know that we are the Atma because throughout our life, we walk around in this world thinking that we are the jiva. And that is where you have these issues, all the, the issues that you talked about. And deep sleep is the state <clears throat> where probably you can... Um, in deep sleep, what you do is you, you lose your body, mind, body um, mind, intellect concept, but then you're still in ignorance. You don't realize you are the atma. Right. Because the, uh, you are still in avidya. What really happens at the time is the mind is not reflecting the Atma. And therefore, when the mind does not reflect, the uh, Atma is not reflected in the mind as Chidabhasa, the Jiva does not exist. And therefore, the world does not exist. Right? So, so that, that state of sleep, then that means you are also losing the consciousness of mind. Right? The mind, so, mind ceases to exist. The mind is resting in the Atma at that particular point of time when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're deep sleep. The mind stops reflecting the Atma yeah. to create the Chidabhasa. Because as long as the Chidabhasa is not there, um, uh, the Chidabhasa along with the Sukshma Sharira and the Stula Sharira is your Jiva. And this is why I've told you multiple times in this class, 
before you wake up, you need to think through what were you doing five minutes ago, right? Five minutes before you woke up. In fact, in deep sleep, so many things are true, which is actually the real fallacy in this world is that we actually go through this thing every day in our life. Every day for six hours in our life, we actually go through the process where we lose our identity of body, mind, intellect. And then when we wake up, the chidabhasa comes in, the mind comes in, and that reflection comes in, and out of which the jagat comes in. When you are in deep sleep, there is no concept of time. You don't know when you exactly went to sleep, when you woke up. It's after you wake up, you realize that you slept for six hours or eight hours. There is no concept of body, mind, intellect at that particular point of time. You don't even know. You don't even know who you are. What is your status in this world? How do you look? Absolutely nothing. All that comes in when jiva is awakened in your body. This is like when you wake up in the morning, you can actually see, right? Um, for a while, you're groggy. You don't know who you are, where you are. You're kind of not really sure. Then slowly as you wake up, you actually first identify with your sukshma sharira and then along with that, your stula sharira. And the minute you do that, you realize where you are and you realize the person next uh, sleeping next to you is your spouse and all the problems or happiness or everything comes in. Until then, you have virtually nothing, right? You have no relationship. You have no problems in the world. You're fast asleep. And that is what the samadhi is. The samadhi is a conscious way of going and realizing Atma. Like you listen to some of the teachings or some of the experiences that someone like um, um, Ramana Maharishi or a lot of other people like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, they've all written. It is that when you are in touch with that Atma consciously, you are in a state of bliss. The level of ananda that you get when you are in that state is far more than any objects that can give you. You don't feel like coming back. In fact, Ramana Maharishi used to be so fast, deep in samadhi, getting him out of samadhi it was very difficult. You had to pour water in and you do a lot of other things. Then you would frequently go into the samadhi. That is like you, that is your true nature. And once you go there, you don't feel like coming back because this is all like for a huge step below the bliss and the ananda that you get when you enter samadhi. Yeah, Hariji, here, <clears throat> one thing that is noticeable is see, um, all the faiths accept that there is only one Paramatma. Right? So there is only one infinite. infinite. There cannot be two infinites. So now, I think rest of the this is um, dwindling between the experience and actually the process that you go through until you get to that final experience, right? So in other words, let's say if you can, if you, uh, of course, people like us, we have to put some effort in and not naturally come to us. So for example, if I compare in, even in Yoga Sutras, it says Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Essentially, it's a state of mind where there are no Chitta Vrittis. But the same Yoga Sutras also define Ishwara as a special Purusha who is not subject to any karmic bondage and all of that. Um, so essentially, if you can cross this theoretical aspect and uh, be able to experience the Tantar Jyoti, then it all falls in place. Um, it falls in play. I think we are getting too deep into it. I think this is something that we should do offline because we are getting into what is Vishishta and Advaita because the fundamental difference in Patanjali Yoga Sutra and this is that <coughs> Ishwara is something quite different than who we are. Yes. Right? Um, it's not, it is something that is we have to attain, but we can never be part of Ishwara. Uh, like, but Advaita does not say that. Yes. Advaita says the difference is just because in the Upadhi, but if you remove the upadi, you are essentially that. And I think that is a very powerful statement. That is the force that caused this universe. The force that is running the universe is the force that is running myself. So our ancient rishis, rishis were able to build the connection between life that powers a human body or all the living beings and the force that controls the creation. That primordial relationship between the individual soul and the Brahman 
is what Adi Shankaracharya preached. In fact, you, in fact, he refused aggressively. If you look back, the Madhvas and the, the Dvaitas and the Vishishta Dvaita came after Adi Shankaracharya passed away because he has very negative things to say about these people. I'm not, again, I'm not as qualified as him to say one or the other, but he made it very clear in his things that there is only Advaita and he was an, the greatest Advaitin that we know. And Chinmaya mission actually is, we, we teach, we are like Shankaracharya is our prime guru. Like started with, starts with Shankara, which is Shiva, he has Dakshinamurti. And then Adi Shankaracharya is the Madhyamam. And then Chinmayananda is below that. And even Kanchi Mahapirivas or all the things Shankaracharyas are actually, uh, um, or Advaitins from that perspective, right? They think of that as, now, again, I'm not qualified to say what is the difference between the two. I know this philosophy, this is what I preach. This is what I believe in. And I'm just walking you through that. Um, but that's why I don't want to go into that fact as which is better, which is wrong. That is not what it is. It is just the most important thing for us to realize is that we are not the body, but we are something beyond the body. And I think as long as we keep that in mind, now, what is beyond the body? What Advaita says is that beyond the body, that power is exactly the same thing as Ishwara. Now, other philosophies might say differently, but all of them say that you have to break away from the body, mind, intellect concept, whether it's Yoga Sutra or whether it is. Um, okay, yeah. totally agree. I think that's yeah, the first, thing yes. we have, first step we have to go yes. through. Yes, yes, yes. Basically, um, that's where I think you know we have to, to some degree experience it by ourselves, by actually, um, you know, like, like Hariji said, whether you sit and meditate or, you know, you go through the meditation process throughout the day, whatever the case may be, I think that's the best way to answer our own questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, the coming to this, uh, like um, Upadi, I think we learned jiva as the chidabhasam and combination of chidabhasam and stula shariram, right? Jiva is a combination of the chidabhasa, sukshma sharira, and the stula sharira. Uh, jiva is it's actually jiva is chidabhasa and sukshma sharira. Um, obviously, when only when atma is there, we can have the chidabhasa, right? So atma is there everywhere. So. Sukshma Sharira is like a filament, as I said. Sukshma Sharira creates a Chidabhasa. And the, the mm -hmm. Sukshma Sharira also controls the kind of Stula Sharira that we have. Sukshma Sharira is the ingredient that goes into the Stula Sharira. So that combination of the three, Sukshma, Stula, and the Chidabhasa is Jiva. But they are Upadis to one another? Upadi is a different concept altogether. There are There is a one, we'll look into it as we go through. Upadi is essentially... Upadi can be anything. Upadi is essentially one entity giving a false property to something that's adjacent to it. So here the Upadis would be the body, mind, intellect concept will be one and the Atma is the other one. So the body, mind, intellect concept is giving the concept of conditioned Atma, even though Atma is all over the world across from your body. And similarly, the body, mind, intellect is Jadam. It does not have Chaitanya. It borrows the concept of Chaitanya from Atma. Mm -hmm. So there are two different ways of explaining the same thing. You can, and I think when you look at it, there are there's a one Prathabhimba Vada model or there is a Upadhi model. But okay. those are the two different uh, ways of explaining the Jiva from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But we all know that the the concept of I that goes into our body is not the Atma, right? It's a combination of our body, it's a combination of our mind, intellect, and uh, body, mind, intellect. That's what we walk around and say, this is I, right? Because yes. when somebody says something about your body or something about your um, ideas or something about your thoughts, it affects you because you have the ego, right? The, e you, the ego is nothing but Ahankara or Jiva that identifies with each of these shariras. And we can be in any one of the shariras throughout the 24 hours, yeah. right? We can start off with uh, really thinking that I am the body. That's what we do first thing in the morning. We look at ourselves. So we think that we are the stula sharira. Then when we go into a team meeting in our, com in our company, 
then we identify ourselves with our vijnana my kosha it's my idea you guys didn't like my idea or you don't like what i say so the we, we take on the vijnana maya or if somebody comes and hurts you at that time you are a mano maya kosha right uh, you said something it hurt me um, at that time you identify with your mind you identify with your mano maya kosha so in the same day we can identify with any one of the koshas and move forward and we can see that right when i say i the thinking i is different than the emotional i <coughs> is different than the body i but we call all of them i and that in itself should tell you that that's not the real i because the real i does not change the real i watches all these things right because you know that you were emotional at that particular point of time or you were um very much focused on your ego or your thoughts at that particular point of time if you were the if you were just the manomaya kosha you should not be able to see what you were in vijnana maya kosha because there is something that is independent of these koshas that's able to see your transformation from one kosha to the other does that make sense like something has to be constant for you to see the change yes it's like the train and the station example i've given you right you have to be at the station to see the train is moving if you are in the train then you don't realize that you're moving so there has to be something that is constant like the other thing that all of us know and i i see it i'm not saying anything per se but i see all the pictures we are all very mature people so at one point we were very young and um, there's only one of us each one of us know how we looked at that particular point of time not even your spouse probably because when you were in college or whatever very few people really might have met i didn't meet my spouse when i was in college so she probably doesn't know how i was in iit right or how i was in college but you know because you go go back and see now i didn't have white hair at that time right uh, my i was a little bit more chubby or whatever so there is something beyond the body that keeps track of the change that you have in your body yes it cannot be the body because the body changes all the time any questions and i think what we'll do is we'll explain this concept of how ishwara and jiva are different by two different ways of looking at it and i think um, we did the first one but i would like to go through both of them today just to kind of for you to really understand um, what what exactly that we are going through so whom do i pick today um, maybe vikas ji you can read you can start reading the the shlokas the english version of the shlokas Which then, one should I read? Ten. Start from ten point one. Start the identifying himself with the gross body. Start from there. This is uh, page sixty-three. Three. Ten point one, right at the beginning. Ten point one is who is the individual soul, right? Correct. And then there is the. I, I want you to just read the English part. We all read the Sanskrit side. Oh, just you mean the definition? The, yeah. The the basically the the meaning of that. Yeah. In the, the exact right font, right? Okay. Identifying himself. with the gross body and known as the jiva is the reflection of brahman 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 this jiva by its very nature considers itself to be different from ishwara the creator that is go forward all the way up to 10 conditionings of jiva and brahman conditioned by ignorance the self is called the jiva conditioned by maya the same self brahman is called ishwara in this way due to different conditioning seeing jiva and ishwara as being different as long as that continues so long this worldly existence of the form of repeated birth and death can never be removed for that reason the mentality of seeing difference between jiva and ishwara should never be accepted yeah just uh, follow read the thing below that in this chapter shri shankaracharya brings in two of the most commonly used similes in vedanta they are the pratibimba vada line 1 and the avacchheda vada line 5 the purpose of these models is to explain the iness that exists at the microcosmic level as well as the macrocosmic level 
In doing so, the models show that the apparent difference between the microcosmic jiva and the macrocosmic ishvara is due solely to the superimposition of the upadhis upon, upon them. The deduction here is that without these upadhis, the jiva is identical with ishvara. This is exactly what is stated in all the Mahavakyas of the Vedas. Let us now describe each of the two models. Yeah, let me uh, ask somebody else to read it. There's a lot more to read. So maybe whom do I pick? Or maybe Lakshmi Ayer, you can start the Pratibhimbavada model. We'll, dis we'll read this description and then we can discuss it after that. Haryon, the Pratibhimbavada model, Bimba means light rays as directly emitted from their source. Pratibhimba means the reflection of the rays of any surface. In the model, Bimba represents the pure consciousness and Pratibhimba the reflected, reflected consciousness from the Upadis. The Upadis in the model, sunlight reflects from the bucket of water and from the ocean. The bucket stands for the Pindanda, individual body, and the ocean for the Brahmanda, cosmic body. The reflections appear different due to the vast difference in the Upadis through which they are reflected. At the microcosmic or Pindanda level, the Upadi is primarily the subtle body of an individual and thereafter the gross body. The reflected consciousness here is called the Jiva. At the macrocosmic or Brahmanda level, the upadi is primarily the sukshma, subtle, prapancha, and thereafter the entire gross manifested universe. The reflected consciousness here is called Ishvara. From the point of view of, of the upadis, they are diametrically opposite to each other. Other terms for the reflected consciousness are chitta basha, reflection of the chit, or Chit, uh, oh, yeah. chit Chaya, the sh uh, shadow of Chit or Chit Pradibimba. All three terms are used in various Vedantic texts. These terms may be applied to both Jiva and Ishvara. Removing Upadis. The pure sunlight is Bimba or Chit or pure consciousness. The reflected sunlight is Pradibimba or Chidabhasha. If the difference due to the upadis are ignored, it means the reflections are ignored. What is left is just the pure consciousness in both the cases. This is the main point of this model. It makes it very clear that the pure consciousness is unaffected by the size or shape of the upadis. In this manner, the jiva, the sunlight from the bucket, is seen to be identical to Ishvara, the sunlight from the ocean from the point of view of consciousness. A secondary deduction from the model is this. The reflection from a bucket of dirty water would be different in quality to that from a bucket of clean water. The jiva has a large amount of impurity in it. The sat sattva in the jiva is solid by impurity, which is why it is deluded by avidya. It doesn't know doesn't know its true nature it is the slave of maya that is Ma maya dasa maya dasa as far as ishwara is concerned the comparison here is the ocean which is always sattvic and pure that this ties up with the fact that ishwara is predominantly sattvic and hence not deluded by maya but is the master of the maya that is maya pati Okay, maybe Rupajit, can you read the second part? Yes, sir. The Avacheda model. Avacheda means conditioning or limitation due to the presence of the body, gross, subtle, and causal. This model compares the pure consciousness to unlimited space, the jiva to the limited space within the part of Gatta and Ishvara to the limited space of the building or mutta is in which the part is kept. The upadi or conditioner, 
the gatha and mutha or upadis or that which conditions or limits. They represent all the three bodies in the case of the jiva and all the three prana prapancha. pra prapanchas in the case of Ishvara. The ghatta is the vaishti upadi individual body and the mutta is the samashti, samashti, samashti. upadi. The prapancha of the cosmic body. The ghatta and the mutta are also known as avachedaka, which is the active noun meaning conditioner derived from avacheda, the conditioning from which the model gets its name. Upadi or avachedaka is equal to the instrument, conditioner or delimiter through which avacheda takes place. The upahita or conditioned. The term upahita means that which is conditioned by the upadi. And in the model, it refers to the spaces as follows. The space within the pot is katta, akasha, or katta space. And within the building, it is mutta, akasha, or mutta space. When the katta is broken, the katta space merges with the mutta space. And when the mutta is demolished, the mutta's, mutta space merges with maha akasha or the universal space. The space. These spaces are conditioned by the respective upadis. The katta akasha is conditioned by the vaishti upadi, vaishti, vaishti upadi and mutta akasha is conditioned by the Samashti Upadi. The Maha Akasha has no Upadi that limits it. The Gatta Akasha and Mutta Akasha are also called as Avachinna, that which is, which is conditioned. Upahita equals Avachinna. Okay, the simile in this model is quite clear as the space within the pot was never different from the mutta space, which in turn was never different from the universal space. So also the jiva in essence is not different from Ishvara and both are not different in essence from Brahman. When the upadis or conditioning, conditionings are removed, the distinctions between jiva and Ishvara are destroyed and their identity is seen. In accordance with the Mahavakya Maha statement, Tattvam Asi, however, whilst the Upadis are present, they give an apparent unique identity to, the, to both the Jiva and Ishvara. Avidya Vishishta Chaitanyam Jivaha, limited by Avidya, Atman is called jiva at the microcosmic level. Maya, Vishishta, Chaitanyam, Ishvara, limited by Maya, Brahman, is called Ishvara at the macrocosmic level. Once again, the main points. Number one, space is always one, even when the limitations exist. The limitations give the appearance that they are different, but that is illu illusory. When the limitations are removed, the oneness is made clear. Space is not affected by the shape of gatta or the mutta. It ever remains pure, like the pure consciousness, which ever remains unaffected and pure. Kind of gives you some visualization of the concepts that we are talking about. Um, let me see if people have any questions or anything that's confusing or I can keep on talking. So, that, that uh, so many uh, sorry, is it <clears throat> correct to understand that Opadi is essentially a medium? So it's not know, really I, a medium. It's it's a, it's the instrument that gives you the conditioning. So the Upadi in the pot is pot space is that pot. Pot is the Upadi that is giving that space uh, uh, a, a kind of a condition. That space within the pot is called the Ghatta Akash. Right, mm -hmm. the akasha is suddenly split into a small component. Even though the akasha is 
the same, but the upad, because of the conditioning of the pot, you think that the pot space is different than the space that's in the room, so to speak, where the pot is, because that is conditioned by the room. So the space is the same, mm -hmm. but it is just because of the conditioning, it looks different. That's why yeah. Atma and Brahman are the same, but Atma is conditioned by Avidya, Brahman is conditioned by the Maya. Just like the Brahman in this thing, the, the Mutta Akasha is, think of it like a Brahman. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> and that's why I said the first thing we have to do is break the body, mind, intellect concept, and then we can kind of get equated with the real nature that we are. And it, the, the Atma is not conditioned at all. Atma is like space, it's everywhere. But the body kind of prevents us from thinking that Atma is all over the place. We think the uh, Atma is there only in the body. Looks like it's a hard disk partitions with the partitions. Once you remove the partitions, it's all <laughs> one switch. Correct. But the hard disk might be a little bit of a difficult example because yeah. you have each of the server layer, which is still different, right? The air is probably a better example there you know, because the air that becomes common. You can't distinguish after that. Maybe the ultimate is to go to cloud, right? Where it doesn't <laughs> matter. It's all in the cloud. It's all in the cloud, yeah. Then, then, then that physical things disappear. It's just, yeah, yeah. You can expect only this from people working in IT. No, which way it works? It's, I don't really care as long as you understand yeah. the concept. Right? Concept. You can go with the Gata Kasha, and this thing is a common thing in Vedanta because in those days, pot was there everywhere, and you could easily explain. And Nowadays, course, if it yeah. is the uh, data center and cloud, then maybe so be it. It doesn't really matter. And also it is, I mean, you know, uh, of course, even if you go beyond Vedanta or uh, maybe a, apart from Vedanta, the goal is to see, I mean, the same Paramatma in everyone, right? So when we realize that, that there is no dispute. You no. Know, the ultimate state is to be able to realize the essence of each of us is the same. Correct. How you get there, that is, uh, you know, up to you and the, effort and all that makes Yeah, and getting there is the first you have to, as they say, you have to get over the body, mind, intellect concept, yeah, right? Exactly. You have to get over the fact that the Jagat is Mithya, then Brahma Satyam, right? The Jagat has yeah. to be broken first, and then only Brahma Satyam will come in. Even when you look at the Shankaracharya Stotram, right? First is Jagat Mithya, Brahma, um, Brahma yeah. Satyam, and then Jivo, Brahma, Napara, right? As long as you believe that the Jagat is real, then the body is real and the and the Ishwara is real, everybody is real. One way to test that is how often you are getting angry. Because once it really sinks in you, you know, it's, it's, it, you need, it, it takes a lot to get upset with someone. Agreed. But I think the problem is that um, in the transactional world, we need to get angry sometimes. Yes. You can, if you don't never get angry, then people take you for a ride. <laughs> And then you cannot work. And you have to fulfill. You need to See, that is where the problem angry. comes in. All these spiritual things are great when you're work, working in a spiritual world, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we're also in a transactional world where ahankaram is important. Right? I, you need to have a little bit of ego. People and will take the issue is that if you pursue spiritual knowledge and you meditate on it, you realize that this ahankaram is a temporary thing. It's not a real thing. It's a role that I'm playing. And don't take it too seriously. But when you're playing the role, play the role with the yes. whatever is demanded of the role. But that is not you. Anilji, I stop you. I don't know. You were, you were saying something. No, no, I just, you need to pretend you're angry. Or like an, it's a game, you're playing the role. So Correct. Like a basketball. The demands you to get angry, you need to get angry. Yeah. The journey. So that's actually get... a serious problem, you know. It's, it's uh, not easy. Once we are deep into this, you know, you don't feel like asking anything. You don't get into these arguments that often. But if you are a manager, um, you have to do enough to protect yourself and, Correct. you know, the organization. Balaji, as you were saying that, right, I'm, I'm thinking of people who are very blissful at work, right? They are not uh, aggressive or ambitious. So as Hariji was saying, right, 
fortunately or unfortunately they don't get picked up for better you know higher opportunities or more challenging things they just keep getting taken for granted and i i don't know like it just re- i just realized that their salary structure also might be little on the but, lower but, side but, uh, vikash i'm sorry to interrupt you but that should not come out of indifference so that we have to understand you know some people what happens is they they're indifferent right ठीक है यू नो आई एम एट अ स्टेज इन लाइफ व्हाट एवर लाइक दैट इज द दैट इज द वर्स्ट वर्ड्स इन हिंदी लैंग्वेज एक्चुअली हां सो दैट शुड शुड नॉट कम आउट ऑफ दैट सो वी शुड बी टेनेशियस एंड एक्चुअली माय एक्सपीरियंस इज वंस वी अंडरस्टैंड ट्रूली व्हाट दिस दिस नॉलेज your ability to work goes up multiple times because now you are separating your emotion to work you know which is the major problem also that yeah i'm sorry to interrupt but you're right you know no, no, some no, people i i get it i get it uh, so I mean, my know, question uh, sorry. sorry no no, no my go. question was the the journey to the maha akasha when you merge with it mm. you are still the atma does that mean that now you move towards being i don't know if an atma can be ishwar but no so we what... will call that we will call that person jeevan mukta that that will be described in future chapter yeah, yeah. what is the quality okay. of the jeevan mukta purusha somebody in this body himself can be realized and if that is the case how does he live in this world right and we the future chapters that will talk about we we call them jeevan mukta purusha that is goes back to balaji what you were saying right i mean i was feeling that if you keep on getting from you know from ghata kasha to muta kasha okay yeah see the ultimate goal is the same <clears throat> see the, the essence of all of us is the same so first we keep saying that then we get to a stage where we actually experience it so everything else is you know how do we get there right so in you know, some people some people they may go through bhakti um, that may appeal better for them some people go through jnana and all that um, no the the thing that balaji garu said is very important you might think that this person is doesn't mind what is happening the issue there is if the person is doing his job to the best of his ability and getting a, doing a damn good job or whatever he or she is doing eventually results will come to him it might not come at the time that the guy who is sorry pardon my word english bullshitting and he might be able to get up very quickly but he comes to a point where he doesn't know what he's doing and he falls yeah. apart right so the, the guy who really knows what he's doing it might be like the tortoise versus the hare right the hare might go fast but it'll not complete the milestone but the issue where this knowledge helps is that if you go with the fact that i will do what is required i don't really care whether i get recognition or not but if i have to write this code i'll write this code to the best of my ability it will get recognized over time maybe not this immediate manager but the same piece of software might be used somewhere else and then that guy will be just surprised with the with the efficiency that is written and he or she will get recognized at some point which is what our culture says is that all you can control is the activity that you do you cannot control the result if you start doing the work based on the result you will never do the activity to the best of your ability karmanya right. vadikaraste that is one but the other way is like ramana maharshi is upadesha saram right kartuha kartuhu like when he talks about if you are doing an action right there are only three things that in any action that is involved you have the person doing the action or the activity itself and the result right if the person who is doing the action controls the result he will not do the activity because he knows what the result is he'll just want to go directly to the result right if the result was dependent on the activity everybody doing that activity should get the same result obviously we see that in the world the same activity does not produce the same result and this is what ravana maharishi calls it there is another entity besides the two called ishwara he calls it kartuhu which actually delivers the results for you it's neither the person who is doing the activity nor the activity itself we don't believe we don't realize that we think that 
we control the result. No, you control only how you do the activity. The result is not in your hands, which is what even Gita says. Right? Don't focus on the result. Do the job to the best of your ability and leave the result to whatever happens from that particular point of time. And if you do that, everything, in everything that you do, you will get the best results. And uh, I also experienced that uh, you should act as per your natural vasanas. Correct. I mean, of course, if your natural vasana cannot be to go around and you know do bad things, that is very, very important. You don't need to become another person. Correct. So the other day, one person was being totally like, uh, you know, he was not doing the right thing. So my manager was there on the call and I yelled at that guy for five minutes. That became a big news in the company. Actually, <laughs> nobody knew I could yell. <laughs> for 10 years, I have been with the company. Mm. And she hung up and called me and said, what happened there? <laughs> I said, look, yes, we got to do the right thing. So, but you should not keep anything here. There is nothing here for us. Um, so we have to, that's all. Yeah, yeah. No, but I think that is also very important that this knowledge will help you in your day-to-day -day life which is something that most of us don't realize. In fact, you talk to a lot of people, they say, oh, I'm too busy doing my transactional work. I have no time. I'll come and look at this when I'm retired. Unfortunately, if you learn this thing on a day-to-day -day basis, there are lots of things that you can do better and it can minimize the stress in your life over the long term, which will also help you be more productive going forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything else doesn't make sense? So we looked at how we are different than Jiva and Ishwara are different. In the next chapter, we'll look at how they are the same. And that is what we call Jiva Ishwara Aikyam. That is the commonality between the two. I see that we are, it's already nine o'clock. So we will look at that chapter in the next class. If anybody has any questions, I don't mind answering the doubt. If not, uh, We'll stop right quote here. that you the quote that you just said of Raman Maharishi. What one? Which one was that? Karata. That is in Upadesa Saram. The first. Uh, it is the third verse or the first verse actually. Kartuhu. Uh, I don't know the verse. I can. I, I'll look at the text and tell you tomorrow. Thank you. And next week it's the same same time class. And uh, once Hariji comes back, then we are shifting it to Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, yeah. So we'll meet again next Monday. Okay. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om All of you have a great week and I'll see you next week. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Babaji Guru. Hari Om. Thank you. Hari Om. Thank you.